I'm going to introduce my daughter, Lucy Berliant, who's going to be singing a couple of songs that Henry and Flora would have listened to. I thought I'd start off, you know, start us off in the right mood. Hit it, Lucy. <laughs> Shout out to my mom for writing this book. Dang. Okay. Um, so these songs my mom gave to me, and I had a sort of idea what they were, but I was like, wow, these are really old. But um, but I've seriously fallen in love with them, and now they're like permanent in my set list. They're amazing. Uh, the first one is Dream a Little Dream by Dream. Doris Day, I think. That's the version I sing. Um, but uh, yeah, this one is really great. Stars shining bright above you. Night breezes seem to whisper, I love you. Birds singing in a sycamore tree Dream a little dream of me Say nighty night and kiss me Just hold me tight and tell me you'll miss me When I'm alone and blue as can be Dream a little dream of me Stars fading, but I linger on, dear. Still craving your kiss. I'm longing to linger till dawn, dear. Just saying this so sweet dreams till the sun beams find you. Sweet dreams that leave all worries behind you. Fight in your dreams, whatever they be. Dream a little dream of me. Dream a little dream of me. Oh, your daddy's rich 
Hey, your mama's good looking. So hush, pretty baby. Don't you cry. Welcome you to University Bookstore. If you've never been here before, we are so pleased to see you. We do over, I don't even know, 300 events a year. It's so crazy. We're doing like three tonight. Uh, we are thrilled to have Martha Brockenbrough here with us. And I have a very special person who's going to come up here and introduce her because I think I would start crying if I tried to. So Jen Longo, would you come up here and do the right introduction? Thank you. talentless hacks, you people. <laughs> Don't take my gum out because I'm a professional. So um, Mel mentioned yesterday that after she was running the event and then I kind of knocked her over and asked her if I could say something briefly. So she let me do this. So I've been waiting sort of for an opportunity. Hey, Stephanie. Um, I've been waiting for an opportunity actually to do this for about a year since I met you. And this is about the book, but I just wanted to just for, just for a second, this will be quick. I'm going to use a lot of superlatives and Adverb, so get ready. I, I, just to talk about not just the book, but about this amazing woman, and I'm, I probably will cry too. So the deal is, I'm, I'm not the only person in the room who's... I've known Martha probably for the shortest time of anyone, but that makes me uniquely qualified, I think, to introduce her because I am the most recent recipient, recipient of her, just her limitless kindness, her enthusiasm for all her fellow writers, and her incredibly welcoming heart. I just moved here from San Francisco. I was brand new to writing. I had a book that I'd sold, but it hadn't come out yet. I was brand new to young adults. I didn't know what I was doing, and I went to the AWP conference at a cocktail hour for um, at my agency, where Martha's agent is also at that agency, and I was just standing there with all these people with Gimlets and talking about publishing and editors, and I was like, oh my god, I'm a fraud, what am I doing? And she, I think, saw that I was feeling that way, and Martha's kind of introverted too, and yet came over to me, and saw that I was overwhelmed, and she asked what I wrote, and as if, who cares, nobody knows me, and she immediately invited, she was like, oh, you're new to Seattle, you need to come and write with us, come on Thursdays, we come write and have some cupcakes and go write, and I was like, what, all right. And she introduced me to the concept of just sitting with other people and then you just write. <laughs> then you put your headphones on, you write some words. But it's, she introduced me to the concept of a writer's life not being one of solitude. And you just sit there and you write. And the thing about her is that she's so excited about everybody else's books just as much as she is about her own books because we all start out as readers and we just want to put books out. And she had a party celebrating this book and she had a slideshow of other people's books <laughs> and like other authors. And I looked up, I'm like, oh, hey, there's my book. Why is my book? It just, she just breaks my heart. Published or not, bestseller or not, it, it doesn't, it, she tells us over and over, it doesn't matter that you just need to respect what we do, be proud, and most of all, show up. She welcomed me into the fold of Seattle. She counted me among the writers. I didn't feel I had any place at all. She made a place for me. So this could be my new home. I didn't know anyone, now I know everybody. And I have the people in this room because of Martha. And I'm sure everyone in this room probably has a story just like that. Whenever anyone says Martha, you just don't say Martha, you go, oh, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> or you go, oh, Martha. And it's my husband's birthday tonight. And I was like, dude, I gotta, I'm going to a thing. <laughs> and he goes, Oh, really? That's nice. Who's it for? And I said, it's Martha. He goes, oh, you got to go to that. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, should I go? And I was like, that's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's, it is, it's, just, it's her mastery. I was so overwhelmed because I've been celebrating National Grammar Day for, since 2008, like all my friends and I have. And I had no idea. I go home and I Google her. I almost peed my pants. Oh, my God. And I'm texting. I just met Martha. <laughs> and it's... It's, that is the thing, it's her mastery and her love of language and grammar, now I'm reading because I'm going to cry, along with her seemingly limitless imagination, a wicked sense of humor that helps her create these vivid, effortlessly visceral and true people. She loves to listen to stories and listen to people's stories, and that's how she makes these characters just be alive. 
this is what she said in an interview once that I love. Books breathe in many cases because of the artful bending of words, punctuation, and expectations. Imagine how awful it would be if someone standardized the grammar in Huckleberry Finn. That would be like putting a tasteful blouse on the Venus de Milo. <laughs> Poor Mark Twain. And you're right. I mean, it's and the mastery of it. I mean, we joke, it's not so primitive, but that's why. When you know it that well, you can make this gorgeousness happen. So, I'm thrilled to be here to help you celebrate this gorgeous book, The Game of Love and Death, and only a writer, only a person with a heart as huge as Martha's could write a story of such exquisite, painful love. Oh, Ethan. Oh. Of such hopeful forgiveness. It's part parable, it's part love poem to this city so firmly rooted in who she is. And it inhabits a world of music and flight and danger and fear and sacrifice. And Kirkus, in one of the three starred reviews, this book so richly deserves and got, Kirkus nutshelled it beautifully when they said, it's at the end, I love this race, class, fate, and choice. They join love and death to play their parts in Broken Rose haunting and masterfully orchestrated narrative. Everything is music in her house and in her life and in her writing. And then one random person on Goodreads, I'm not going to go back, I just saw this one thing. It serves to warm readers just as quilts themselves can carry messages and patterns that reflect the quilter's state of mind. This book honestly examines life and death and the love that happens in the midst of all that. If you haven't read it yet and you get to the end and you don't cry or at least choke up, it's probably just because you're dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay because then you meet Martha and Martha, she's going to fix you. So, a gift to words, an amazing friend, a mother of two beautiful world-changing dragons, so thanks for putting that out into the world, thanks, another, and a prized gem in Seattle's crown of literary leaders, the amazing Martha Broken Road. <laughs> check is in the mail. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to University Books for hosting this. Um, so this book, I worked on it for years. It was not all fun um, or much fun. But what I wanted to say, it's on, it's on its surface. The Game of Love and Death is a story about two teenagers, Flora and Henry. And they fall in love. Flora is black, Henry is white, you know, there's an obvious, obvious obstacle, but the real one they don't really know about is that there are these supernatural shapeshifters, love and death themselves, who are manipulating the game, and if Flora and Henry don't love and choose each other, then one of them is going to die. And, you know, I, I talk sometimes about where this book came from and why I wanted to write it, and part of the reason is all of you here tonight, most of you I know, um, you know, there's my husband, Adam. Tomorrow we will have been married 17 years. And so, in part, <laughs> you know, this is that kind of love story. There are people here who I've known since childhood. Um, I saw my brother here. Hey! Um, and, you know, that's, those are, like, friends and family. That's another kind of love. Um, so we got romantic love. We have the other kind of love. And, and uh and there's a love of the people who are no longer with us, and that is part of the fabric of this book. Um, so Lucy sang, and those songs are so beautiful, and that's one of the reasons that I said it in the 30s, is I love that music. When I originally wrote this book, and it was in contemporary times, and uh, I just knew it wasn't quite right. And so I started thinking about, you know, when else could this story take place? When could I change it and make it a better story? And I really wanted it to start. I'll read a little bit and you'll see why. You know, it start, I wanted it to start on Friday the 13th of February because February 14th obviously is Valentine's Day and that's the most loving day of the year. And, and I just love it you know, when it's right next to a Friday the 13th, the worst day of the year. <laughs> And in the 20th century, there were only a few dates to choose from, and one of those was 1920. And so that's kind of when the story starts, and that's when my characters were born. Um, there are still some jazz singers of that era born that year performing in Seattle, which is pretty cool. With Sundays on, um, at 5 at Vito's, Ruby Bishop, where Henry gets his last name, she's, she performs. She's 95. Um, but also, uh, 1937, it was a time a lot like today. 
There were lots of very wealthy people. There were many desperately poor people. There were a lot of people hanging on the edges. And one bit of bad luck was all it would take to leave you homeless. Seattle then had eight Hoovervilles. Um, those were homeless encampments named for Herbert Hoover, um, sort of like we had Nicholsville. Um, the, the largest one in the nation was in Seattle. And I read a master's thesis about what it was like. And it, the language, it was, it was really funny. You know, it, was, it was in a kind of a keen tone. Um, <laughs> but the, um, you know, he talked about the city actually burned down the Hooverville twice. Um, the, you know, Seattle was not always an easy place to live. It's a great place to live. It remains a great place today. But it's not always been an easy place to live. And there were a lot of people on the edges. And so, in part, um, this story is inspired by that and what it means to live on the edge. A lot of the story came from my own teen, <coughs> child and um, teen years. When I was 12, I had a great science teacher, this man, Chris Melgard. And um, he, in, he didn't just teach us about what hydrogen was. During our lesson on hydrogen, he played us an audio recording of the Hindenburg exploding. And I mean, what a great way to show how people use this gas and the devastating power of it. And so I took that audio and I actually, the, one of the lines, oh, the humanity, that got cut because my editor thought I was making a joke. And it, when um, there's the scene, you'll, you'll, you'll read about the, um, my alternative explanation for the destruction of the Hindenburg. Um, and I did watch the video on YouTube. So that was one source of inspiration. Another source of inspiration for the book, um, when I was 16, I took an art class from this guy named Robert Fulgham, who later became very famous for All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. So you know, this great book based on a great essay. He was an incredible teacher and was teaching us the concept of paradigm shift. So when you know your mode of something goes from one way to another, and he was talking about it in terms of war. So Picasso's painting Guernica was what he showed us to demonstrate how war had gone from something where people were marching with bayonets and shooting and stabbing each other to something that could be waged from afar. And we think about World War II and the ultimate role that airplanes had in that. And when you think about drones today and how we've taken human life and made it something that we can take without much cost. And so that was one of the things, that, that painting inspired me, I never forgot it. A third thing, I played the viola in the Seattle Youth Symphony and I used to go to orchestra camp. Um, which you cannot, there's no nerdier sentence except, you know, you could say, I used to take my viola to orchestra camp and then you've reached the top of Nerd Mountain. Um, but we, we played this really beautiful piece um, by Edward Elgar and it was called The Enigma Variations. And to, it was not only a beautiful piece that has a movement called Nimrod, which means warrior, not idiot. Um, but anyway, Nimrod was a really beautiful movement with a good viola solo, and those things are incredibly rare. And so I, I always remembered the song, and I was very curious, you know, why he called it the Enigma Variations. And so I read a newspaper interview where he explained, you know, um, the chief characters in a drama sometimes appear off stage, and that felt sort of magical to me because I read that after I had created these love and death characters who, you know, were were meddlers off stage. And so I'm like, ah, the, the Enigma Variations has to be in there. And so Henry, my male protagonist, is a bass player. He moves from classical music where every note and every bowing and every dynamic is scripted to swing jazz, which is much more of a conversation. It's much more improvised. And so that kind of worked with some of the themes of the book. Um, uh, I also, Flora, the, the female, protagonist, she aspires to be a pilot. And this is one of my questions is, in 1937, could a black girl with not much money, she um, is a part owner of her parents' jazz club, could, could she have aspired to be a pilot? And you know, this was, this was the year that Amelia Earhart died, so it was a really big year in aviation. And you know, I knew that at that time, there weren't any famous African-American female pilots, but 
I looked a little further back in history, and there was a woman named Bessie Coleman who, in 1922, was working as a manicurist in Chicago and hearing the stories of men just back from World War I, and she got really interested in the planes that they had seen, and she wanted to learn to fly here, but no one would let her, and no one would license her to do that. She even asked African-American male pilots if they would teach her, and they said no. Um, you know, she was a woman, so two strikes against her. She earned enough money to go to Paris, where she became the first African-American um, in the world to have an international pilot's license. And she came back to the United States and flew a bit and wanted to learn more. So she went back to Europe and studied with um, German pilots and became one of the world's premier stunt pilots. She, would, she was a barnstormer. And, you know, poverty still played its role in her life. She was one of 13 children. Um, one of her parents was, I think, half Cherokee. Um, so she didn't come from any sort of privilege, but, you know, she accomplished all this. Her airplane, unfortunately, was poorly maintained, and she fell out of it during an accident, and she passed away. But it means it's entirely possible that someone in 1937 who was from, from Flora's background could have been a pilot. So as you read, know that this all could have happened. Um, oh, and then there's one more little bit of inspiration and why I wanted to tell this particular type of love story because I'm not really a mushy person and I was always embarrassed about reading romances. Um, when My first book, which came out in 2002, was called It Could Happen to You, Diary of a Pregnancy and Beyond. Lucy. <laughs> so Lucy, who sang, this book was about um, when Lucy was born and the first year I was her mom. And a few years after it came out, I got an email from a 15-year-old girl who said she had read the book. And I thought, that is an interesting choice for a 15-year-old girl <laughs> to make. Um, and, and she said, you know, tell me about being a writer. And, and she said, I want to be a writer too. So we, we corresponded, we exchanged an email. And uh, then she started asking me other questions that made me very nervous. And so I said to her, do you think you might be pregnant? And she said, yes, I do. And she started telling me, this is the, the story that, um, you know, this boy who lived down the street, she had known since childhood. Their parents were both away. It was her first time, his first time. She was from a conservative Catholic family. And um, I really felt for this girl because I also grew up in a pretty conservative family with a Catholic mom. Um, and I knew exactly what it would feel like to be in that situation and have to tell someone that I was pregnant. And it would not have felt good. Um, in fact, it, it would have, I, I can't imagine anything that would have devastated my parents more. And so I walked her through the process of getting tested for pregnancy and yes, she in fact was and then I, you know, she was in Wisconsin um, and so, you know, I wasn't near but I wanted her to be taken care of and so I made sure she told an adult, she told the, the boy, she's, she got taken care of. But I asked her about the father of her child and she said, well, when I was seven and he was eight, we went for a bike ride and I crashed, and I fell off the bike, and he carried me home. And I thought, oh, that's really nice. And then, you know, she went on to say, the next day, outside, he brought my bike back and leaned it up against the house. And I thought, you know, in the midst of a really difficult and sad and terrible and scary thing happening, um, the bike wreck and the pregnancy, here's a boy who, loved the girl, and he did the right thing. And they had loved each other for many years. They ended up getting married, and they're raising that child together. And, you know, I, I think that as small and, and personal as that first book I wrote was, and it was, you know, it was my story, it was the story that, it was the book that made me a writer. Having Lucy was the thing that gave me the courage to do it. That book didn't sell a lot, but it found one reader it needed to find. And in a dark time for her, she found a little bit of light that led her, I think, toward 
a better place, and that's what books can do. And so that's that's the heart of the story that I wanted to write is um, when there is darkness around us, love lights the way. We are all, every single one of us in this room, unfortunately going to die. Everything, I mean, it's one of the lines in the book that pretty much everything we know crumbles. And what makes it bearable is the love that we have for each other as friends, as family, as spouses, as parents. Um, so thank you for being here and for being part of this. I'm gonna read a bit of the first chapter and then I'm going to encourage you to eat some food and get your picture taken and have fun. Okay. So chapter one, Friday, February 13th, 1920. The figure in the fine gray suit materialized in the nursery and stood over the sleeping infant, inhaling the sweet, milky night air. He could have taken any form, really, a sparrow, a snowy owl, even a common house fly. Although he often traveled the world on wings, for this work, he always preferred a human guise. Standing beneath a leaded glass window, the visitor, who was known as Love, removed a small pearl-headed pin from his tie and pricked his finger. A bead of blood rose and caught the reflection of the slice of moon that hung low in the late winter sky. He bent over the cradle and slid his bleeding fingertip into the child's mouth. The baby, a boy, tried to suckle, his forehead wrinkling, his small hands curling into fists. Shh, the figure whispered. This player, he could not think of one he'd loved more. After a time, Love slipped his finger out of the boy's mouth, satisfied that the blood had given the boy a steady heart. He replaced his pin and regarded the child. He removed a book from his pocket, scribbled a few lines, and tucked it away again. When he could stay no longer, he uttered two words as softly as a prayer. Have courage. The next night, in a small green house across town, his opponent made her choice. In this house, there was no leaded glass in the windows, no gracious nursery, no wrought iron crib. The child was a girl, a girl who slept in an apple crate, happily so, for she did not yet know of anything else. In the house's other bedroom, the child's grandmother slept lightly, listening from some ever alert corner of her mind for the sounds that would indicate the child's parents had returned home. The creak of a door, the whisper of voices, the careful pad of tiptoeing feet. The old woman would wait forever to hear those sounds again. Wearing a pair of soft leather gloves, Love's opponent, known as Death, reached for the child, who woke and blinked sleepily at the unfamiliar face overhead. To Death's relief, the baby did not cry. Instead, she looked at her with wonder. Death held a candle near so the child might have a better view. The baby blinked twice, smiled, and reached for the flame. Pleased, Death set the candle down, held the baby close to her chest, and walked to the uncovered window, which revealed a whitened world glowing beneath a silver flannel sky. She and the baby watched the snow fall together. At last, the child fell asleep in her arms. Death concentrated on her essential task, relieved when she at last felt the telltale pressure behind her eyes. After much effort, a single black tear gathered in her lashes. Death removed her glove with her teeth. It made hardly any noise as it hit the floor. With her index finger, Death lifted the tear. She held her fingertip over the baby's clean, warm forehead. Slowly, carefully, she wrote directly on the child's flesh a word that would be invisible. But this word would have power over the child, and later, the woman she would become. It would teach her, shape her. Its letters, seven of them, gleamed in the candlelight. Someday. She whispered this into the baby's ear. Someday, everyone you love will die. Everything you love will crumble to ruin. This is the price of life. This is the price of love. It is the only ending for every true story. The letters sank into the infant's dusky skin and vanished as if they'd never been there at all. Death put the baby down, removed her other glove, and left the pair of them on the floor where they would be discovered by the baby's grandmother and mistaken for something else. 
The gloves would be the only things she would give the girl, though there was much she had taken already, and more she would take in the years to come. For the next 17 years, love and death watched their players, watched and waited for the game to begin. I cannot say how much it means to me to see you all here. I am really, really so grateful and pleased. So thanks, and thanks to University Books. And I'll be signing around the corner.